So welcome folks to our second uh, BB STEM cybersecurity trifecta meeting of November. Uh, it's a little bit weird this week because we'll have the, this week's meeting, then we'll turn right back around and have a meeting next week because of the fact that we do have uh, the Christmas break. So be aware it's not the second uh, and third, uh, second last Thursday next or Tuesday next week or next month. It is actually the first and third, I believe it is, first and third. But there's a couple things I want to go over today to begin with. Um, I do want to talk a second about kind of where we're at, and I'm going to turn off my video because that way we're not using that bandwidth. Um, I'm sharing with you a sheet where I went in and looked at the number of students in our classes and what has been completed, um, really. And this is kind of our, uh, um, just a, a an update, and, and I won't say it's come to Jesus' meeting, but a, a, an idea of getting us together and saying, hey, this is where you're at. There are 114 students in the Network and Essentials class. And with the due dates that are on that class, really at this point, you should have been through the chapter one through five checkpoint exam. So you should be reading and doing those quizzes. You'll notice I've only had 23 out of 114 people do the chapter one quiz. I am allowing you to do the quiz multiple times and your highest grade will be the only one that's actually accepted. And again, you're not gonna pass or fail this trifecta without it, but just be aware, if you take a look here, we've got 23 do it, have done chapter one, 16, 12, eight, and then only one has even tried chapter five. No one has done the checkpoint exam um, at all. So uh, just kind of throwing that out there to let you know you've got these items available to you. Um, use them. And I know you're busy and I know you have things going on, um, but it is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it is available online. So if you have time to, to work on those, that would be very good. Um, the dates are set for the rest of the Networking Essentials um, assignments and quizzes. And so if you can, obviously, like I said, we have 114 students. It'd be very nice if we had a little more participation in those quizzes. <laughs> Likewise, on um, vecompetitions.stanley.edu, I have 119 students in the VE Competitions lab. So evidently, some of you have not been enrolled in Networking Essentials yet or working on that. Um, only 26 students have completed at least one lab, and only one, only six students completed the first four labs as requested in the last two weeks. So uh, be aware that that vecompetitions.stanley.edu, you do not have to be at school to do that. Um, you are anywhere you've got an internet connectivity, you can log in. Your login is the email associated with your Netiquette account and Cisco123 all lowercase if you have not um, logged in yet. If you have logged in, then it will be whatever you've set it to. So. Again, those, we'll, we'll talk a little more about the labs that are there, but you've got a huge amount of labs. In fact, I've actually just enrolled you in a second course uh, in that DE competition, so you now have access to the ethical hacking labs, and you have access to security plus labs, and there's a lot of overlap in those, too. So be aware that those are there for you to okay, use also. Yeah. Finally, I went in and created two new so, courses for you. Here. One is the Introduction to Cybersecurity course, and the other is the Cybersecurity Essential course. And I have set dates so, for all of those in terms of when the quizzes are due. Um, the and quizzes are for cybersecurity, and I'm going to go on in. Okay. Whoever is. All right. I just, T.S. Smith, I just muted you. Um, but as I go into these courses here, Okay, so I've created the Introduction to Cybersecurity and the Cybersecurity Essentials. You'll note that under the Cybersecurity Essentials or Intro to Cybersecurity, I've gone into the quizzes and given you a um, date for your quizzes. So all these are due uh, through December. And I also even gave you on the assignments, there's a final quiz uh, and of course assessment, and I gave you uh, a due date for it. So this is a, a, a neat little intro course Need for cybersecurity attacks, concepts, and techniques. This is important, and we'll talk about it because it's going to be directly related to what's in our chapter that we're going to look at today in Chapter 7 of our Network and Essentials course, protecting data and privacy, protecting the organization. And so this is directly related to your STEM trifecta. Likewise, if we look at the Cybersecurity Essentials course, you'll see there's um, – Roughly seven modules, eight modules available with a quiz in each one. I've given you due dates up through January 21st for the last, actually the last quiz is due January 28th. So at this point, you should be finishing up the cyber, uh, Networking Essentials 
information and network essentials course information. So this course you should be finishing up and then you should be jumping right into introduction to cybersecurity and then cybersecurity essentials. Once you're done with these, that's when I'm going to get you into a Red Hat class. Um, and we'll start actually getting you to go through Red Hat uh, training and you'll be able to get more Linux training. <clears throat> but we need this background so you can get started. All right. Um, like any questions? Okay, I'm on. All right, I'm going to have to mute you. Yes, Mitt, 026, can you mute yourself? And then that way you can unmute yeah. yourself if you want. Okay. okay, thank you. And if you need to talk, just come off mute. All right, any questions? And again, I know it's a lot, but it's, well, it's really not that much. There's not that many course uh, modules in this particular section. See people still coming online? Okay. All right, so today I want to jump into Networking Essentials, and we're going to launch the course, and we're going to look at network security. So at this point, you really should have been through these first couple of chapters. I was going to talk about Chapter 6, but it goes into what is a Wi-Fi, what is Wi-Fi, setting up Wi-Fi networks. This is stuff you probably already know. I want to go ahead and talk about uh, the security section because this directly relates to what we are doing in our cybersecurity competition. We're going to look at what types of threats are, what types of um, tools can be used to mitigate threats, and we've already we'll talked a little bit about our tools we've been using in um, BE competitions, and then we'll look at configuring some firewall settings in order to um, mitigate some of these different types of attacks. To begin with, uh, in networking and in cybersecurity, one of the big things we always need to do is we need to define what are known as assets. And assets are those things that could be threatened by a, a threat vector or some type of vulnerability. What I want you to do right now in the classroom you're sitting in is I want you to look around and I want you to, to just real quick among yourself, identify three assets. Do the mentors have access to these courses? Yes, you do. You are, I can add you in as instructors. Um, and then that way you can see them, but you also can create your own course. But I'll add you all in as, as additional instructors for those courses. So let me, I will do that for all the instructors over here. As long as you have instructor credentials to do it. If you haven't finished your instructor credentials yet, then no, you will not. Some of you had not had those, and so I put you in the course to finish up um, when I was up there months ago. Um, and you will have to finish that course before I can give you access as an instructor. So look around. I want you to find three things in the room you're in right now. And I'm gonna I'm gonna put in chat three things in mind. And I want you to type in three things. So uh, let's see. There you go. I've got an ASA firewall sitting right here on my desk. In fact, I'll, I can turn on the camera and you can actually see that again. But I've got an ASA firewall, which is a pretty expensive little firewall, about a $400 firewall that's sitting literally right here. Okay. So there's an ASA firewall that I'm playing with to learn the new firepower software. My cell phone. All right. My limited edition Halo cat helmet, which is right over there. If any of you bought back in the day the old limited edition Halo. Woohoo! All right. A little bit of junk there, but it is nice that somebody might want to steal. Smart boards, microwaves, cell phones. Okay. One of the things I think people fail to forget or fail to mention is this. Each of you, okay? And that's something to think about, and it's something the military is very good about, exactly. The military is very good at identifying their people as being an asset. So when we start looking at network or looking at security, one of the first things we really try to do is we identify anything that is an asset, okay? Now, what makes something an asset? Well, 
it's something that's valuable, something valuable to your company, something valuable to your place of employment. For what we're then going to do is we're going to look at those assets and we're going to look at the threats to those assets. What is a threat to the assets? So a great example is my cell phone and your cell phone. One of the threats to your cell phone is that someone will simply steal your cell phone. Cell phone. So that would be a threat. And then you can start looking at a vulnerability. And now some of the threats aren't just someone stealing your phone. It could be someone hacking your phone, someone placing malware on your phone. That could also be a threat. And then the vulnerability could be a, an application that's on your phone um, that would allow it to be hacked. In addition, a vulnerability could be something that's, you know, honestly, it's just your phone small enough someone can just put it in their pocket. Okay? So that's a, a, a vulnerability. And then we start looking at what we call mitigation. Um, how do we mitigate the threat? Okay? How do we, re how do we reduce our, our vulnerabilities and our, our threat uh, surface areas? And there's multiple ways of doing that. Now, one of the things you already know about is patching. When you patch PCs, when you patch phones, when you patch applications, you're patching vulnerabilities in most cases. That's one thing you can do. You can do, um, we call reducing the surface area, or you can reduce surface area, surface area. And that can be something as simple as remove the unneeded applications. It's one of the reasons I bought a Pixel phone straight from Google. I didn't want Verizon's junk on my phone. I wanted all my the things on my phone that would be the things that I wanted, not junk that someone else put on it. That makes your service here. This is very, very important on servers. When we start looking at servers, especially servers that are web servers, you want it to be locked down as much as possible so that it only is running the applications that are necessary. When you did your lab, when you went in and did um, the lab in ethical hacking, and you were doing your NMAP and your AMAP scan, one of the things, oops, I mean, I actually do something different. One of the things that you were doing is you were running scans to see what applications were running. And on many of these machines, as you ran those applications, you see all these different things running. You see IMAP, you see HTTP, you say HTTPS. So in other words, it's running a web server. It's running uh, an email server. It's running uh, Microsoft uh, directory services. It's running SSH. When you go to set up PCs and servers on the network, you want to actually reduce the number of, of services that are open so that you don't have to have um, open applications that can be attacked. Likewise, there's some there's things that can happen, uh, you know, as far as a risk. I could drop my phone in the river tomorrow, duck hunting. If I do that, guess what? I could lose all my data. Um, I could lose my phone. How do I mitigate that risk? One, I try to put it in a waterproof case, or I buy, actually I buy a phone that's waterproof. Okay. Uh, reduce SA, service area, yep. 287 plus 28. Okay, very good. Now the LW, service area equals two times length, height, width, all right, let's, John, you have to explain the LW to me in 2LH. I have not heard that before. What John put in here is reduce the surface area equals 2LW plus 2LH. Yep, there you go. Okay. Gotcha. Sorry, not a math major. But this data loss and manipulation, how do I mitigate that? One thing is I store everything in the cloud. Okay. So I store things in the cloud. I also have insurance on my phone. So if I lose my phone or if my phone is destroyed, I can replace it. Identity theft. This is huge right now. There are so many different uh, places coming out about hacks. Uber just put in, just let us know about the 57 million hacks that took our um, accounts that were hacked uh, just last week. And disruption of services. Now imagine, what, what was yesterday? Anybody know what yesterday was? So did anybody buy anything online yesterday? Yep, Cyber Monday. What would have happened if you could have successfully stopped a major retailer, let's say Amazon, 
or Walmart or Target from being able to access or have their websites accessed yesterday. It would have been catastrophic. I mean, it would have been millions and millions of dollars lost. So, as we're looking at these different types of threats to our assets, we also want to look at where our attacks can come from. Now, all of you right now are a threat, all right? You are a threat because you are internal to the network. So there are internal attacks and external attacks. And most people think that we get all these um, these news accounts and all these things about these big attacks on, you know, uh, Equifax and on Uber, and that they're all external attacks. And yes, they are very bad. <laughs> In fact, when you start getting, you know, nation states doing external attacks. But the problem really becomes, too, the internal attack can be even more of a problem. Because I can come in and say, uh, you know, like one of you that already has access to the network somewhat, hey, guess what? I'll give you $20,000 if you'll do this. Or I'll give you $40,000 if you'll do this. That is how source code for the iOS, Cisco iOS, was actually stolen. They had someone come on site and actually work at Cisco for a while and then take that code and remove it and send it overseas and then leave the country. So internal versus external threats. Be aware of those. Which one's more dangerous? I would say yeah, internal attacks are more dangerous, especially there's another um, matrix we sometimes see that is called internal structured attacks. Okay. You have internal unstructured attacks. You have external structured attacks and external unstructured attacks. Now, what does this mean? Well, imagine this. All of you now know how or should know how to run Nmap, okay? So when you go to run Nmap, if you were to run that on the internal network at your school, which by the way, don't do that, but if you were to run that, okay, and just scan around and see what's open, that's an internal unstructured attack. You're looking for targets of opportunity. You're just looking for what's out there and what's available. You're not looking for anything in particular. If, however, I gave you $20,000 and I said, I want you to get me this, then that would be an internal structured attack where you come in and you know what you're focusing on and you know what you want to get. External structured attacks and external unstructured attacks are exactly the same, just where they originate. This would be you sitting at home running NMAP on your neighborhood. Again, don't do that. It's illegal. And then an external structured attack would be what happened when you start trying to steal all the data from a particular company because you want that information for different reasons. Could be espionage. Could be anything. Now, one of the main things you're going to be doing in your, especially in your um, RFP, is looking at social engineering. Now, what is social engineering? Anybody? Everybody? Social engineering is probably the easiest way to get into a network. You go buy your shirt that says, uh, XYZ telephone company, you walk up, you say, hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm Bob with the telephone company, and I need to check your telephone system because of XYZ. They let you into the closet. Next thing you know, you're able to put a sniff on their network and grab information. By the way, Kevin Mitnick, that's one of the ways he did many of his hacking attacks, is he social engineered his way. Or, i give you a great one, okay? Had uh, Bob from Microsoft call me the other day and say that my computer was producing static on the internet. Well, I went along with Bob and joked with him and said, okay, Bob, I'm at my computer, tell me what I need to do. And what Bob was trying to get me to do was to go in and load malware on my machine so he could then try to get my credit card number and get me to pay them to get the, the malware off my machine. Um, I messed with Bob for a little while and then made fun of him and told him to quit messing with people. But that was social engineering. And it's one of those things to where some people would fall for it, okay? 
you know, if I called someone on this campus right now and said, hey, my name is so-and-so, I'm with the campus IT team, I'm new, uh, we're doing a password audit, uh, send me your password in a sealed envelope so we can test it, you would be amazed the number of times that actually works. So that's social engineering. It's really just uh, conning people into doing things. Bayside, do you have a question? Anybody got a question? I just mentioned that one of the questions that you see, they're like, what's your mother's maiden name? And yep. people will post things on Facebook that are like, find out your pet's true name, and it'll yep. be your mother's maiden name or whatever. That's a very good idea, very good thing. If you have security questions, and those security questions are things like mother's maiden name, uh, your favorite pet's name, those types of things, it's very smart to actually use fake answers. So if, you know, your mother's maiden maiden name is Smith, put down, you know, Wilson or whatever, and just remember what you use, because that way there's no way anyone can associate it with you. Um, anytime you make a password, it should never be associated with anything to do with you. It shouldn't be your favorite football, basketball, cycling, whatever. It shouldn't be any of those items. It should always be something that's extremely difficult for someone who who does not know you, but would look at your social media feeds to figure out. This is a big one too, phishing, when they send you a link. we I just had a, an entire thing on uh, looking at phishing schemes and those. Typically the way a phishing scheme will work is they'll send you a, an email that says, uh, your PayPal account is about to expire. It's going to be locked if you don't update your information. Click here to update it. Well, first off, PayPal is not going to do that. Um, you know, they, they wouldn't send that to you. And if they did, you can just go to www.paypal.com and log in. Don't ever click on a link. Uh, you also can hover over a link and typically actually see where that link goes to. Um, you have to be very careful this day and age because they actually do have drive-by malware where if you just go to a web page, you can actually get that malware installed on your machine. So you have to be very careful with that uh, this day and age. But phishing is very real, and I'm, they're getting that out where they do uh, phone phishing, where you get all kind of junk on your phone. I had somebody call me the other day and wanted Software, viruses, worms, and Trojan horses. Well, a virus, folks, is a piece of malware that typically requires user interaction to uh, move from one PC or one device to another. So a virus needs you to put it on a flash drive and move it, or it needs you to share a flash drive between two different machines. A worm is a virus that can self-replicate. So a worm is uh, much more dangerous because once it infects the system, it attempts to, to actually replicate itself and go out without user interaction, without anything on the user's part. And then a Trojan horse, these are the ones that really scare me because you know, even if you download Putty or you download something from the internet that is a, a good program, for instance, uh, not too long ago, CCleaner uh, was infected with malware, uh, even though, you know, that's a very commonly used program by many, many people. Um, it, it actually was infected at its source, and people were using it, and they were installing malware on their machines. Um, so a Trojan horse is something that appears to be one thing, but it is another. Um, just like the story of the Trojan horse, which they thought was a gift, and it had soldiers inside of it. So, again, it's a game, but guess what? It goes in and deletes your hard drive, or acts like it's deleting your hard drive. By the way, some of the funniest things you can do um, uh, is to do uh, the screensavers. It shows it's actually deleting somebody's machine. Not that I've ever done anything like that. Um, but viruses, again, spread by modifying other programs, they cannot typically move from one machine to another on their own. Worms can move on their own, own excuse me, and then Trojan is something that appears as one thing, but it's actually something else. So you're not actually playing Space Wars, you're actually deleting your hard drive, which is actually a little hard to do much thing. But the Uber uh, hack, and many of the hacks here recently have been talking about um, hacks that go in and encrypt all the information on the hard drive, and then it's called ransomware. And then they go in and say, hey, guess what? I want you to uh, pay me $10,000, and I'll give you the key to decrypt your information. There have been school systems that actually pay that, that ransom um, because it was cheaper to do that than try to get the data back. Well, then normally what happens is if you pay the $10,000, they come back, oh, well, really what we meant was $20,000. We need another ten. Um, so paying those ransoms are... A real slippery slope. 
Now, what about denial of service? Again, I want to get to the web corp, uh, web server, but this DOS attacker sends pings and ping keeps pinging and it actually overwhelms the web server. Now, this is actually why in many cases you'll notice that when we have labs that have you ping or if you try to ping across the internet today, it will not work. Uh, if I actually do, if I opened up a command prompt here and I uh, type ping, www.google.com, you will see that it resolves the IP address. So DNS is working, but the ping doesn't work. And the reason ping doesn't work is because uh, most networks block ping going in and out of the network itself. Now I can ping locally. I mean, I can ping a local machine um, if I want to. So I can ping, uh, if I ping uh, VE competition .stanley.edu. It actually works because I'm pinging a local IP address or an internal IP address. So this ping works internally, but as soon as I try to ping out on the internet itself, it does not work. And that's pretty common because of this fact that we, there for a while they had PODs or pings of death. And so you would just send ping, you ping Google, it always replies. Well, and at home it probably will, John. Um, but the problem with, uh, our network here is we block it. I bet if you tried to ping Google from your lab from your labs right now, if you ping www.google.com, it might would fail. Um, if it works in your in your lab, I'm actually surprised um, because most networks block ping on the outside edge. Google actually allows pings to their networks. It's that most networks don't allow pings to leave their network, and I, the reason is because imagine this. Imagine that. Right here where this black hat hacker is. Imagine this is Stanley Community College, okay? And let's imagine someone were to compromise all of our PCs on our campus and then use our PC to take down Amazon on Black on Cyber Monday. Now, are we now legally liable? Yep, exactly. A distributed denial of service attack, exactly, John. Are we now liable for that attack? And so that's why most of your networks will block pings leaving their network. So we've got ping, ping, ping of death. Um, that's one that could be bigger than the loud size. This causes a uh, divide by zero error, which causes it to go to infinity, which is a buffer overflow. And then there are send floods. And if you remember back in chapter four, I believe it is, of networking essentials, we talked about where it talks about TCP send send act and act. So you know um, that when you create a connection between two PCs, TCP, because it's connection oriented, sends a TCP send, oops, excuse me, TCP send is sent over to from the originating host. The other host sends back a send act. Okay. And then finally, you get an ACK sent from the originating machine. So this is what's called, this is the three-way handshake of TCP, okay? Oops. Three-way handshake. So in our example network here, if this machine wanted to go to the website, the first thing since HTTPS uses TCP as its protocol, this machine would send a TCP send over to the web server. This web server then opens what's called a half open connection when it sends its send act back. So this causes a half open TCP connection right here. So it causes a TCP half open connection because it is now waiting. This machine would be waiting after it sent the send act for the act from the original machine. Well, a send flood is when you take thousands of machines and you send, uh, spoof their IP address and you send TCP sends to a machine. ACK, okay, ACK is acknowledged. ACK is acknowledged, so it's an acknowledgement. So basically, this synchronization, TCP synchronization says, hey, I am machine X and my synchronization number is five. And it's really a lot bigger number than that, but it'll say five. This machine will come back and say, okay, my number is four and here is six because I'm going to acknowledge your send number. And then finally, the originating machine sends an act. Yep. 
Whenever you visit a website or a server, you're doing a send. Yep, definitely. Now watch this. I'll show you something cool. Um, let me see if I can get it loaded here. Now it's only to begin the process, only to begin the actual um, setup of your of your connection. And this is actually we we do this in our in our lab. So here's here's Wireshark, and I'm going to go to capture, start, uh, no interface selected. Let me check my interfaces. Capture, capture, not filters. Get my interface. Okay. So now it's capturing here, but let's go capture and it's running. So let me try this. Remind me later. And what I'm going to do is open up a new web browser and go to velonews.com, which is a website about cycling. All right. So now what I'm going to do is stop this and I'm going to look for TCP. And let's see if we can't find. Actually, let's do this first. Let's look for DNS. DNS, look for, there's Google, 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 YouTube. Should be down toward the bottom. Let me get down here. I got so much going on, it's hard to find it. Go back and get rid of this. Mike's going to do a new cat. Ah. Capture, start, continue out saving. And I'll go to a different site. Let's go to. Gamesworkshop.com. All right. So I'm going to stop this. Now there's the Games Workshop lookup right there. Okay. And you're looking at a DNS lookup. So it's packet 3397. And I need it to uh, display filters. Okay. So there's the, the query there. And then let's go 3397, let's say TCP, 3397 right here. Okay, so here is, I'm a thin Sennac and Act. There's Act. There's my sin. So here's my machine going out to Games Workshop. Okay, and the reason I can tell you that is because let me go back to DNS here and I'll show you. Here's the games workshop. So the IP address, there's my query. And let's see what my answer is. My answer is standard query for this. And then right here is the answer, which gives me the IP address. That's community.com. So the IP address is 104.17. That's one of them anyway. So 104.17 is what it's telling me. My DNS responded. I'm going to go to TCP. All right. Uh -oh. it was 33, hold on a second, too far back. Yeah, 3397, and you can see how doing actual packet capture and analysis is can get kind of kind of lengthy. But here we have a, a send, okay, that's sent. We should get a send act back, which is right here. So you can see this 159, 157, so before I can connect to the website, I sent a SIN, and inside that SIN, TCP sends a sequence number. Now, these are relative sequence numbers, so it doesn't show you the actual sequence numbers. You can change that inside the settings, but for now, we're going to leave it at that. You'll notice that the 159, 127 IP address sent a SIN ACK, 
And so what it did was, is it sent a CINAC that has its acknowledgement number, okay, or excuse me, its sequence number and an acknowledgement of my sequence number. So this was a response to frame 3985. So here's 3985, there's the SIN, there's the act, and then my machine sent back an ACK, okay? And then it goes, then it starts immediately doing other stuff with multiple other things here. But there's a sin, sin act, and act. And once that is completed, the three way handshake is, is finished. And at that point, you have established, and that's why they call TCP connection oriented. You've got to go through that three step process, that handshake, before you can start sending information. It then goes on to do all the stuff it's got to do to send information using um HTTPS and all those different things after that. What happens is if you can flood a machine with send packets and it sends back send acts and it's waiting for an act from the originator of the send, then it has half open connections. And one of the things we've been able to do is been able to set up uh, attacks that will actually fill up the half open connection queues and then that machine can't accept any more um, sends and it can't respond to anything TCP. Which slows the server more? Um, ping is probably more immediate because it immediately floods traffic. TCP uh, send requires you to overload that buffer. We've also got some, uh, be aware too, that most modern firewalls today um, have both ping flood or ping of death and ping flood mitigation and they even have TCP SIN flood mitigation. So what they can do is the firewall sitting in the middle will actually send back a SIN act as a proxy for the remote host. Uh, and it can even they can be set up to even see a SIN flood and recognize a SIN flood. So, I mean, if you normally only got 200 connections and suddenly you've got 4,000 SIN connections trying to come in, modern firewalls today are smart enough to say, you know, Palo Alto firewalls can go, hey, look, this is no longer on, something's wrong and actually stop the um, stop the attack uh, as it's taking place. So I would say immediate impact is ping floods, um, but a probably a more, a harder thing to stop is honestly the SIN flood, because think about it. With a ping flood, you can just go into your firewalls and turn off ping. You don't have to have ping for your network to work. But if I go in and turn off TCP three-way handshakes, nothing that relies on TCP works anymore. So ping flood mitigation is actually easier than TCP send flood mitigation. Does that make sense? That is correct, John. If the, if the firewall stops it, then yes, it, it would actually, um, in some ways you're, you're then committing a, a denial of service attack on yourself, but the thing is, it looks at the attacks and um, we'll do it temporarily and then we'll start bringing them back online as it feels that the uh, sin flood is, is going away. And also what happened is most of these distributed denial of service attacks that use sin floods, once they see a um, firewall actually blocking that information, uh, they will then begin to, to, to start, you know, they'll throttle down and then try to throttle back up. So yes, it's very difficult um, to uh, to actually stop the sin flood attacks. Now there, there's all kinds of things we can do now that, that, that help mitigate it, but it is it is difficult because what a hacker is doing with a sin flood it is it is actually using a protocol feature as an attack, and that that becomes very difficult to stop. Now here's here you can see this is a distributed knob service attack when they, they infect all these other machines and in those machines attack a web server. And if you've ever heard of zombie nets or you heard of um, zombies uh, or botnets, those are what are used typically in a denial, distributed denial service attack. Spyware, uh, I will tell you this, even things that aren't spyware scare me to death. How many of you have been searching for something? So for instance, you're searching around and you look at a uh, I don't know, new jackets or, you know, I'm looking for REI uh, winter pants because I wanna, I'm want i going to Canada in a couple of weeks and it's going to be extremely cold. Well, you search for it one time on Amazon and the next thing you know, you've got 
40,000 ads asking you, you know, here's these new superfangled pants that, that block all snow. Um, so that's, that's even though that's not spyware, it's kind of scary. Okay, uh, John asked, how do you initially infect the hosts that are used to, for DDoS attacks? There's multiple different ways you can do it. You can send them a phishing email. You can send them a whack-a-mole game. Hey, play my game whack-a-mole. And they go and click on it. Next thing you know, you've, they've loaded a botnet on it. Uh, it can happen by what's called drive-by installation. In other words, you just go to a website, and the very fact that you visit that website, it downloads malicious code and infects your machine. So there's all kinds of ways it can happen. Um, there's no one single way to do it. And that's really, when I was talking about was these tracking cookies, so it's not always spyware, but it is kind of a uh, 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 a bad thing at times. It's nice at times, too, because sometimes I've actually, believe it or not, I got a couple of Kickstarter recommendations that were pretty good uh, because of tracking cookies. I will tell you this, just because you go incognito, do not think for one second that you're not actually able to be tracked, okay? If you go incognito, so in other words, if I go here, and I go new incognito window, and I go, oh, I'm going to go to anywhere I want on the Internet. Well, guess what? Everybody on this campus who's in IT can still see exactly where I go. Um, so don't think that being incognito actually keeps you from being tracked. Adware pop-ups, we've all seen those before. Here's our zombies. We're talking about uh, John, botnets and zombies. So in other words, you've got a machine that infects multiple machines, and then it can be used for things like spam. It can be used for distributed denial of service attacks. Typically, you have what's called a command and control center, many times using uh, IRC, or Internet Relay Chat um, Control, Command and Control. And let's see, I'm going to see if I can find that article for you. If I can, I'll actually drop it into our class. Um, I'm looking up a botnet DDoS attack, trying to find down. There's been one several years ago that Sys Internal used that talked about it. But now there's so many, there's Mira. There's so many different uh, different ones now. One thing I will tell you about that's a really cool site that if, you've not, if you're not keeping up with, um, Palo Alto Networks, who makes the, the next generation firewalls and are really pretty much handing it to Cisco on the firewall market. Um, they've got this group called Unit 42, and two weeks ago when I was at their corporate headquarters, we got to listen to one of their guys talk about some of the different types of things they're doing. But this Unit 42 blog is a really neat thing that tells you about all different types of uh, attacks that are going on, types of uh, exploit kits, all, just everything's kind of going on. I mean, look at this. You're looking at uh, ransomware, looking at how it's become a lucrative, you know, business model. You know, in 89, that's the first known ransomware. Now you've got these crypto lock, crypto lockers and Tesla crypt and all of these things, you know, here's Karanger, you know, you know, targeting OS X, you know, because there's no viruses that ever affect uh, Apple products. But now you're looking at these ransomware becoming not only uh, a business, but an easy way for criminals to make money. So you start looking at cybersecurity and this is a whole looking at the Verizon data breach report. They actually give you a report on what happened. Um, you know, I always tell my students this, and, and this is something I could, you know, many of these people that are, are cyber criminals, they can go in and rob a bank uh, and have the chance of being shot, caught, or they can sit behind a computer and do these things from a country that has no extradition treaty. And, you know, honestly, they're working uh, as part of a government-based thing or even part of a um, organized crime. This Unit 42, I uh, highly recommend that you subscribe to the reports and that you actually read the reports because it's very neat um, what they talk about. Here's the, looking at command and control activity, uh, attack vectors. Here's an entire thing on credential phishing, so how to, how to try to grab your credentials and use those uh, in attacks. All right, so... Um, Keep moving on here. Some best practices. Obviously, if you do use a password, use something that is um, uppercase, lowercase, alphanumeric. 
Also, folks, I highly recommend anytime you can to use multi-factor authentication. For instance, uh, if you know anybody in the military, they have a CAC card and they use the username and password. So in order to get in their systems, they have to have a username, password, and a CAC card. Um, I got everything I can set up that can uh, they use as a username and password. I also have to set up to send me a text so that I have to have my phone with me. That way, if someone does, for some reason, break in my credentials, um, they would need my phone, my username, and my password in order to get in. That's called multi-factor authentication. Um, how many of you heard of biometric authentication? What does that mean? Anybody know what biometric authentication is? When you look at authentication, by the way, you typically it's something you know. When you're looking at authentication, something you know, something you have, or something you are. Okay, so what would be something you know? Your PIN number, your password, etc. Something you have, that would be your, your credit card, your CAT card, your RSA key, if you happen to have RSA keys. And then something you are, this is biometrics. This is, biometrics can be your fingerprint, it can be your voice print, it can be your retina scan, it can be any of those things. And by the way, one of the things they found uh, I had a funny thing when I was teaching some military class talking about biometrics. Um, they had man traps, and that was a little where they, you'd go in one side, and then you had to be authenticated on the other. And they were using um, biometric scanning of the retina, and they kept having certain female members of the uh, command getting caught in the man trap for whatever reason. And come to find out, um, when you become pregnant, your retina changes slightly, and that was they were actually finding out that uh, they were pregnant because their biometrics were failing. So needless to say, they had to make some changes to the way the biometrics are reading. So what are some tools we can use? Well, one obviously is a firewall, and it can be on your window. It can be on your Windows box as a host-based firewall, or it can be a network-based firewall. Spam filters, patches, antivirus, pop-up blockers, anti-spyware. And none of these are any good whatsoever if you don't update them. So make sure you install them and then update them. So again, patches. Many of the worst hacking attacks or worst items in uh, the history of security have been attacks that target items that have been patched for a very long time. Um, so even though the big thing, there are companies that have policies not to install patches immediately, be aware that you can, um, on your own personal systems, patch them fairly quickly to keep up to date. Way to kind of detect infections, is your machine acting squirrely? Is it slowing down? You have a large number of processes open compared to normal. You know, if you look at your task manager, one of the things I teach people is learn the number of normal processes on your machine. So right now I've got 149 processes, which honestly, on my machine, that's not that bad because I got 47 billion things open. Uh, right now, there's no telling how many web browsers are open on my machine. Look at all the Chrome browsers by themselves. Um, Google Drive, everything's in here. So, um, but if you were at home and you normally had 70 processes and you suddenly ended up with, um, you know, 200 or 150, then you know something's going on, okay? If your performance suddenly went south, um, it's kind of like learning to drive a car. You kind of know what's wrong. Your car's not acting right. But if you spend enough time with your PC, you kind of learn that too. Use good antivirus. I'm not going to spend much time on that, but not only use it, but update it. Use anti-spam both in your local machine and on the uh, internet, uh, on your actual server itself. Don't forward things. Don't, I mean, just use some common sense. Don't open things from people you don't know. Don't forward emails that say if you don't forward it, 900 people will die. Nobody's going to die if you don't forward this email to 20 of your friends. Okay, you'd be amazed the number of times I get emails from people about that going, oh, yeah, guess what? Uh, if I don't forward this to you, 17 puppies in Eastern somewhere will die. Really? Okay, a uh, question from Bayside. One of my students ask, is kernel data in page error related to security issue? Not necessarily. Um, when you're showing, uh, let's see, where was it back here? I think it's kind of this, some type of fatal exception or kernel. What I would do on that is I would Google it 
first off, what were you doing when it happened? Have you loaded any new software on your machine? Is it something that can be replicated? In other words, every time I open this one application, does it happen? Um, when I use uh, plug this USB drive in, does it happen? Um, yeah, okay, now that's not that's not a virus. That is probably, uh, says when you're trying to wake your computer from sleep, 99% of the time that's a result of needing to update the, uh, the uh, firmware on your PC. And then that way, or also what you can do is turn off the power functions in the BIOS and allow just the Windows operating system to do power functions. Um, I've seen that happen um, when there's some some PCs, the internal BIOS sleep functions and the Windows software sleep functions fight each other. So I would I would say about I won't absolutely guarantee it, but about 95% sure that has nothing to do with a virus, and it's probably just those two items fighting each other. I would boot it into BIOS, turn off your um, BIOS level um, software, no, no, not security settings, but wake sleep settings, and let Windows handle it and see what happens, because that would probably fix it. Yeah, that kind of thing I wouldn't expect. It. But now let's say you were just, Say you're using your machine and it just suddenly started rebooting itself or it started slowing down, um, that would be a different story. But that, since it's re uh, you can reproduce it, no, it's probably just a, a, a firmware update issue. I'd try that too, just update the firmware on the on the, the machine itself. So what is the, oh, Sarah, do you got a question? No, sorry. No, it's okay. I, I'm sorry, Jeff, I just want to make sure. Um, so what is a firewall? It is a device or a piece of software designed to allow or filter different devices. So basically, when you think about a firewall in its most basic form, it is a device that allows for permit and deny statements. Permit this, deny that, okay? Now, that is what's called a, a packet filtering firewall. We have um, today much more next generation firewalls, much smarter firewalls that can do not only just deny based upon is it a SQL packet or this, but you can even look at is it a SQL packet to a particular SQL database or is it a web connection to a particular website. Um, next generation firewalls are much more um, intelligent than just a basic packet filtering permit or deny firewall. Firewalls can also be designed, typically when we design a firewall, we look at an internal network which, which we consider clean or secure, an external network that is dirty or unsecure, and then sometimes you have a network off the side here that's called a DMZ, a demilitarized zone, and that is an area that's kind of gray. It's some, like, for instance, if I had a web server I wanted to have people have access to it in my house, stick it down here in a DMZ, that way people coming in from the internet can just go into the DMZ. They don't have to go all the way into the, into the internal network. Port forwarding, this is something you need to do if you've got a router at home and you're trying to do, uh, you're having NAT issues with your Xbox or your PS4 or your Switch or whatever. Um, you also can, uh, most modern home firewalls have a little DMZ option so you can put a PC or a, a device in a DMZ. And then port triggering, that's, if you need more than one connection, this is where you can actually go through and set up and do a port trigger. So if you actually open a certain program, it'll open the ports for you as that is going out. We've got you, there is a lab where you do some, some firewall settings here, and you can do this uh, inside the Cisco uh, net labs, and I'll get you in those as we move forward. But it's not really important that you, you're doing those so much as you're just doing the labs we've already got for you. So that is Chapter 7, folks. And really, as we look at what we're doing in terms of our labs and in terms of where we go from here, obviously, I asked you to do um, the first four labs in the ethical hacking item. So you would have used NMAP. You would have looked at social engineering, exactly what we just covered here. Metasploit, which is a really dangerous and fun tool to play with because it gives you the ability to deliver attacks and actually uh, crack open systems. Remember, as part of this cybersecurity competition, you have signed an ethics agreement. Uh, if you go to jail, it is your own fault. Okay, Jail is bad. Remember that. 
But once you get done with those, I want you to move on through and do the next four. So I really, before we get done with this, you're going to do all 20 of these labs. So I'd like you to just continue to work through these labs. Once again, let me show you how to schedule a lab. If you need to schedule a lab, you click Schedule, Schedule a Lab for Myself. You now have two classes. You have an ethical hacking class and you have the Security Plus class. Okay. So right now I'm just having you focus on ethical hacking. Click on ethical, ethical hacking. Let's say you were going to do this backdooring with NetCat. Click there. Find yourself a pod. There are 30 something pods, 32 pods available. Find a pod. Pick a time. It could be in the future. Okay. It could be right now. Either way. Okay. But pick yourself a pod and then give yourself time to do the lab. Now, remember, one of the things about the labs is you got a maximum of four hours. First 10 minutes are used to boot the pod. Last 10 minutes are used to clean it. So be aware that you will um, not be able to get into the pod for the first five or 10 minutes as you're going through. Okay. And then now these are actually booting, and I've got this booting. Uh, and you'll notice when as the lab's booting, it'll say initializing pod and you will not be able to get into it. The content for the lab, once you are able to get into the lab, the content for any lab sits on the content tab. So this is actually where we can go through. If I was doing this password cracking with John the Ripper at Hashcat, well, it would be there. By the way, you will probably have a collie box that you could use during the cybersecurity competition to attempt to break into other machines and get information. And maybe what you want to do is generate some password lists and then use those to do a brute force attack. And right here is how to do that using John the Ripper. All right. So are there any questions? That pod's done this thing. Like I said, it takes about 10 minutes for a pod to initiate. The last two chapters in the Network and Central's course, while they're important, um, you know, they're not going to be um, quite as important simply because when we're looking at doing, uh, actually working on Cisco gear, this just gives you a basic information on how to configure a Cisco device. And so we'll um, just talk about LAN switches and those things, which is kind of neat. Won't necessarily be what you're going to be doing in the cybersecurity competition, but it's nice to know. And it's something that kind of gives you an idea of what you would be doing as you move forward in the uh, in the curriculum. All right. Let me go back down here and get all the way down there. And then the last one is testing troubleshooting, which is always a good thing because you learn the utilities that you need to use. So different types of testing. So at this point, you should be finishing up the Networking Essentials course in NetAcad, moving on to complete the Introduction to Cybersecurity class. Uh, if you're working through the Introduction to Cybersecurity, you should then, uh, once you've completed that, move into the Cybersecurity Essentials class and all at the same time be working on your labs in this ethical hacking pod. Are there any questions? I know we're close to when you've got to get out of here, here in a little bit. Any questions that we can do before you do? All right, I'm going to stop the recording real quick.